Well, it's good to be with you. Thanks for being here, being one of the few people that's still here in Phoenix, uh, hasn't left for cooler temperatures or whatever. Um, it's good to be with you. We are going through the book of Hosea, and last week, if you were here, the, it got a little hot in here, got a little intense here. Like, we're going to turn that down just a little bit this week. There's a little less intensity this Sunday, but there's still a little heat in there, so it's kind of like that, you know, mild, medium, hot. Last week was like hot salsa, and this is probably more like medium. Hopefully, we'll get to mild at some point, but Hosea doesn't do a lot of that. Um, we're going to do a little bit of review of Hosea because we've been going through this book. Um, we've been trying to learn from something that was written, you know, thousands of years ago in a different language to a different people, um, and we've been trying to draw out a, a message for us what the Spirit of God is speaking to us today. Hosea is also an interesting prophet because he's one of few prophets um, that God didn't just give the words to that he was supposed to speak, but God kind of took him on a field trip, so to speak, to try and understand the feeling behind what he was supposed to speak. And it was not a nice field trip. It wasn't one they do in elementary school at all. Um, the field trip God took him on was he was supposed to go and, and find a prostitute and marry her and bring her into his house and start a covenant of faithfulness with her, saying, I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm going to care for you for the rest of your life, and I want to make a family with you. And so they entered into this covenant, and they had children together. And throughout the process of the rest of Hosea's life, as far as we know, she continued to run away to other men run away to continue in her prostitution, run away and continue in her adultery. And Hosea felt that. Hosea experienced that. And then at some point God said, go and get her and bring her back home. And so there was this constant challenge of heartbreak, of frustration, of anger, of disappointment, of hopeful moments, beautiful moments, destroyed by unfaithfulness over and over again. And then the word of the Lord comes to Hosea. Hosea, this is how I feel in my relationship with my people. Just the way your heart has been broken over and over and over, so is my heart. And I'm angry and I'm frustrated. I feel jealous. I'm mad. But it's all because of my love for them. And so there's this whole mixed emotion. So God just, God just lets it out through Hosea. And Hosea lets it out through Hosea. It's just like a lot coming out. And so as you read through it, you just, you basically like just dodging bullets constantly as God's just un, un, like kind of opening up the spigot, letting all of his emotions out. But there's some really important things that we can draw out of here. And so last week was, was how, how much God sees how entangled we are with the world, how unfaithful and adulterous we have been, not just the people in the city that we live in, but us as Christians in our own personal relationship with Jesus. We have been so unfaithful. And then this week, um, we're going to focus a little bit on more what, what we can do. And, and it really comes to us um, in Hosea chapter 6, if you want to grab a Bible and turn there. One last thing before we jump in is this timeline. This is one of my favorite things, Bible timelines. I mean, talk about a nerd. I love Bible timelines. They're like my favorite things. And so I made this. Oh, actually, I didn't make this. Dalton Davis made this for me. And I'm sharing it with you because I'm hoping there might be at least a couple of you out there that are like super into timelines as well. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you for the nice ones who are with me, even though you're not with me. Thank you to the few of you who are too embarrassed to say you're with me. Um, so anyways, this is a little timeline of Israel's history. So you've got the United Kingdom. This is the 12 tribes, all as one, united nation under God. Um, and then you've got King Saul was the first king, then King David. Everybody knows David killed Goliath. He was a great king. And then his son Solomon reigned. And Solomon basically took Israel to be this extreme world power. Extreme world power. Then after Solomon, something happens. King Rehoboam down there on the bottom, he was Solomon's son. And he thought, I'm going to tax the people even more than Solomon. We're going to be even better. But the people were like, you're no Solomon. And uh, the 12 tribes of the north 
decided to rebel against Rehoboam, and they went to the north with Jeroboam. Couldn't have been more confusing for Bible students for the rest of time. Jeroboam and Rehoboam, come on, can't we just get a little bit more differentiation? But it's true. King Jeroboam in the north, ten tribes. King Rehoboam in the south, two tribes. Those ten tribes in the north is who Hosea is prophesying to. And often they're called Ephraim because the name Israel can be a little confusing at that point. So those are the ten tribes of the north. Those ten tribes of the north actually were destroyed in 720 B.C., um, the fall of Israel, that was two years after Hosea died or finished his prophecy. So Hosea literally in this book is saying to the Israelites, if you do not return to God, you are going to be destroyed by the Assyrians. He actually says that in here. And the people did not return to God. And sure enough, like we talked about last week, in a horrific way, the Assyrians came in and destroyed the people of God. And took them as captives. So that happened in the north and the south. That didn't happen until 585 B.C. Um, when the fall of Judah happened. And that was Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon and all of those type of things. So, and then the last little thing that Dalton did this because he's so amazing. Is those um, prophets on the top of that line are prophets to the north. And those prophets on the bottom of the line are prophets to the south. Eh? Eh? <laughs> nope, I'm nerding out right now. Um, but yeah, that is a beautiful thing right there. Thank you so much, Dalton. I love it. Um, yeah, there we go. Give it up for Double D. Um, Dalton Davis, he's an awesome man back there. So one last little thing on the timeline thing. So my daughter's closets, they don't look good. They're just... Uh, Brittany and I's closet looks good. It really does. It, not always, but right now it looks good. And it's because we have a system. We have an organization. We have timeline in our closet. We have these rods that go across, and we have these shelves. And so when we have clothing, we're like, oh, it goes right there. And it's very nice. It, you just put it right there or right there. My daughters, they got nothing. They don't understand all of that. The Bible timelines are like that. You start reading in some book, and you don't know where it fits into the timeline of the Bible. But once you have this timeline, once you have this structure in your mind, then it's so fun to read the Bible and be like, oh, I know that this guy was written after the exile. Actually, this guy's writing while the people of God are exiled in Babylon. It's just, it's so fun to be able to slide those things in there. So don't, come on, Bible students. The Bible gets so much better when you start to really kind of grasp some of these things. So we'll keep throwing them at you. You kept laughing at them or whatever. If you want me to send that to you, email me. I'll send it to you, and we can nerd out together. All right, Hosea chapter 6 is where we are today. Come, let us return to the Lord. For he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. Very interesting thing to hear about God. Not only the one who heals, but the one who tears. Not only the one who binds, but he does see fit at times to wound. But he says, let's return to the Lord. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he'll raise us up that we may live before him. A little bit of the gospel right there. Jesus Christ on the third day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hosea knew about it somehow. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. He is, his going out as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as sure as the showers and the spring rains that water the earth. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? Northern ten tribes. What shall I do with you, O Judah? Southern two tribes. Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. Therefore I have hewn them in by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. So here God is calling to his people to return. You've gone astray. In, in later part, he says that they've actually been consecrated to, to Baal, to other gods. They've become more worldly than they have godly. They care more about the things of this world than the things of God. They're more, um, they have more expertise in the things of this world than the things of God. They know how to please themselves much better than how to please the Lord. And what God sees is they need to return so that he can break them. So that he can 
heal them. But God is not making any bones about it, so to speak. He's saying, if you return to me as a father, I will discipline you. If you continue to run from me, you will be destroyed. His call to return to him has their best interest in mind because he sees what's coming if they don't return to him. And Jesus said the same thing. He said, those who fall into the hands of God will be broken, but those who fall under the hand of God will be crushed. And there is a reality to when we return to the Lord, it's not all party time right away. But when we return to the Lord, that's where this word repentance comes in. We turn to the Lord in this humility. We return, and the Lord does discipline us. But he does it because he loves us. He breaks off the rough edges. He begins to try and transform the the wayward spirit within us and renew a right spirit within us. This is what God does, and this is the call to return So I want to take just a minute, and in the book of Hosea, as well as the rest of the scriptures, there are warnings if we do not return to the Lord. And so what happens if we don't return to the Lord? Well, Hosea 11.5 says, Assyria will rule over them because they refuse to repent. Matthew chapter 11, no miracles were performed for them because they did not repent. Luke 13.3, unless you repent, you too will all perish. Revelation 2, 5, if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand, remove the light from your life. Revelation 2, 16, repent, or I will soon come to you and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. You want to deal with the sword in Jesus' mouth? Huh? I don't. That sounds so scary. So repent, or you're going to have to deal with that sword coming out of the mouth. That's Revelation. It's a whole nother ballgame. Um, what happens when we do return to the Lord? Let's put it in a positive. So we can go Old Testament, New Testament here. Um, 2 Chronicles 32 says, Then Hezekiah repented of the pride of his heart, and the Lord's wrath did not come on them during the days of Hezekiah. And I loved Ryan's prayer about the pride in our hearts. We do need to repent so that we won't see the judgment of the Lord come. Proverbs 1.23 says, Repent at my rebuke, Then I'll pour out my thoughts to you and make known my teachings. There is nothing more beautiful and lovely than the thoughts of our Lord. Nothing more life-giving. Nothing more precious to us than the thoughts of Jesus. Isaiah 59, the Redeemer will come to those who repent of their sins. And this is a beautiful promise. What that means is that if you repent, not only will God start you anew, but he can restore and redeem all the years that have been lost. All the years the locusts have eaten. All the years alcohol has destroyed. All the years your sexual addictions have destroyed. God can redeem even those years. That's some deep stuff there. I feel like somebody should have like done something right there. The Redeemer will come to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you were feeling it. You're just like, it's church, man. What do you want me to do? Uh, Jeremiah 15, 19. If you repent, I will restore you that you may serve me, not just redeem you, but now I'm going to use you as a precious vessel to carry my love to others. Jeremiah 18. If that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict the disaster I had planned. Ezekiel 18. Repent and live Ezekiel 33, if someone who is wicked repents, their former wickedness will not bring condemnation into their future. If you repent and come to Jesus, he washes your past clean so that doesn't even have a voice or a say in your future. Your sins and iniquities I will remember no more. I won't hold them against you. You'll come and you'll say, hey, I'm sorry about that. And he'll be like, I don't even know what you're talking about anymore. It's covered. It's gone. This is beautiful. Amos chapter 1, return to me and I will return to you. Luke 15, 7, heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents. You could cause a party to break out in heaven, which is cool. Uh, Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's no greater gift to all of humanity than that. If you don't know about the gift of the Holy Spirit, go talk to Kirk Carter right now. 
Um, Acts 3.19, repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come, not just for you, but for everyone in your household. All the kids right now are looking to their parents and saying, will you guys repent so that we might have refreshing in our house? And all the parents are looking at the kids saying, would you just repent so we can have refreshing in our house? Repent so times of refreshing may come. So, re- returning to the Lord is a good idea all the time. Returning to the Lord is not just a moment. It's a lifestyle. It's a way of living. Martin Luther, when he was calling the Catholic Church to repent of all the craziness they had gotten into, he nailed 95 theses onto the door of the Catholic Church in Gutenberg, Wittenberg, somethingberg. And uh, he nailed it there, and on the very top of it, the very first line said, all of life is repentance. So what we're trying to do through the book of Hosea is figure out how to cultivate not just a moment of repentance, but a life that's lived in returning and repentance. So that's what we're going to try and do the rest of this message. So track with me here. If you need to kind of smack your face a little bit or pinch the person next to you because they're already asleep, go for it. This is important stuff right now, and it's going to be a little wordy. So what does returning to the Lord look like outside these church walls? What does it look like basically everyday life? What does it look like Monday through Thursday? I mean, Thursday, Monday through Saturday. <laughs> Take it easy, you know? Um, anyways, what does it look like to have a life of, re- of returning and repentance? Um, and I'm going to borrow for some others to help us understand this. Uh, the Christian word for returning is repentance, as you might have picked up. It's a little heavier and hits a little harder than the word returning. It acknowledges our guilt, our shame, our wayward hearts, and our entanglements with this world. It acknowledges our need for discipline. Our rough edges need to be ground down and smoothed out. It feels a lot like humility and vulnerability, but it's actually the safest and most fruitful place to be. There was a guy named uh, Eugene Peterson who wrote a book called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction as he described what the Christian life is like. I love it. A Long Obedience in the same direction. And this is a long quote, but it's really, really rich, um, and it really will serve us well. So uh, try, and, try and take this all in. It'll be up on the screen so you can read it with me. Repentance is not an emotion. It's not feeling sorry for your sins. It's a decision. It's deciding that you have been wrong in supposing you could manage your own life and be your own God, which is actually such a relief at the same time. It's deciding that you were wrong in thinking that you had or could get the strength, education, and training to make it on your own. It's deciding that you have been told a pack of lies about yourself, your neighbors, and your world. And it's deciding that God in Jesus Christ is the one telling you the truth. That's what repentance looks like. Repentance is a realization that what God wants from you and what you want from God are not going to be achieved by doing the same old things and thinking the same old thoughts. Repentance is a decision to follow Jesus Christ and become his pilgrim in the path of peace. Repentance is the most practical of all words and the most practical of all acts. It is a feet on the ground kind of word. It puts a person in touch with the reality that God creates. And I love this, that it's just taking this whole idea of repentance from this emotionally charged moment in a church service or in in some situation where you're sorry or you got caught by your sins or whatever, and it's changing and it's saying this is a way of life. This is a boots on the ground type thing. It's the most practical of all words and the most practical of all acts. It is a way of life, repentance. It's not penance. It's repentance. Um, If we go on, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was an interesting guy who was trying to help the church figure out how it could walk in a way that was godly and important while while at the same time he was living in in Nazi Germany and and Hitler was on his rise and Jews were being killed. And, And all of these things were happening and Dietrich Bonhoeffer was trying to help the church figure out how it's supposed to act and be in that moment. And he talked about repentance. He actually uses the word metanoia at the end of this, which is the Greek word for repentance. And he says this, 
living unreservedly in life's duties, problems, successes, failures, experiences, and perplexities. In so doing, we're throwing ourselves completely into the arms of God, taking seriously not our own sufferings, but those of God in the world. That, I think, is faith. That is metanoia. That is repentance. And I think this word right here, I'll probably be chewing on this all year. But he says it's, it's not taking seriously our own sufferings, but it's taking seriously the sufferings of God in the world. That's what repentance looks like. It's recognizing and understanding that, 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 there, that God is suffering in our world. There are places of pain in our world that causes God's suffering. And Jesus, the way he described it was, when you visit someone in prison, you're actually visiting me because I, I'm suffering along with this person. When you give food to the hungry, you're actually giving it to me because their sufferings are my sufferings. When you heal the sick, when you clothe the naked, when you comfort the lonely, you're actually doing it to me. Because those are the places of God's suffering in our world. And one of the things we want to do is we want to engage in society's pain at Living Streams. That's one of our tenets. And the reason is because we know that somehow in the places of society's pain is the place where God is. That's where he's found. It's what the Beatitudes teach. And we want to find those places and be in those spaces. And that's what repentance looks like. It's turning away from ourself and turning into the places where God is suffering. Yeah, right? Everyone's just staring at me like, are you going to make more sense of it? That's all I got. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was smart. I'm like leaning into it. I said I'm going to look into it for a year. Maybe I'll have something at the end of it. I, it but it's just, it's, it's huge. It's huge. So here's another attempt by me to try and bring it a little bit more practical and clear. Maybe what it feels like. We have this feeling that Adam, our father, Adam and Eve, you know, Adam gave to us. We want to love ourselves. Your kid's first word is me, mine, a lot of times. You don't teach them that, and if you do, don't do that. But they just learn it on their own. We want to love ourselves, but repentance, instead, we resist that urge, we turn from that desire, and we choose to love others because Jesus loved us in that way. One of the ways that you can tell if you love yourself too much is to have someone move in with you. I used to have these guys. They paid rent. I didn't see them that often. They lived in my house. And then at one point, I got married, and then Brittany moved in. And she didn't pay rent. She was always there. And, you know, it was awesome in a thousand ways, but it was a lot less me time than there used to be. And then... And then I don't know what happened, but then these kids started coming in. And they looked like us. And then they were there, living in the house, and they didn't care about my me time. They thought, they thought all my time was their time. And that was cool. And then we got foster kids. That was hard. That was heavy. Yeah. I whined a lot. There's a whole nother level of selfishness that got infringed upon that I was perfectly okay with before then. But, uh, yeah, I think inviting someone to your home is really one of the best ways that you can um, rebel against, repent against um, our, our selfish nature. And, uh, and that can be anywhere from fostering or adoption, which I think is one of the main things the church should be about right now in our day. Um, but it also could just be once a month saying, hey, we're going to invite someone in that maybe doesn't think like us, that doesn't act like us, that, that maybe doesn't even like us, or something. we're just going to kind of go outside of ourselves and see if we can bring someone in that maybe just maybe we can find the Spirit of God as we care. Or maybe someone who's suffering in some way, we're going to once a month bring them in. I don't know. But that's one way to do it. We also want to stock up money 
and possessions because of the security and status it brings, but instead we resist that urge, we turn from that desire, and we live with less in order to give away more money and possessions to those who don't have it, not because they deserve it, not because they'll be able to pay us back, but because that's what Jesus did for us. This is what a life of repentance looks like, constantly chafing against that whole idea that we need more money, we need more security, we need more comfort. And so maybe you're someone who, you know, gives 4% of your income to others. Maybe we, maybe we go for 10 this year. Maybe we go for 10%. Maybe the tithe is a good challenge for you. Maybe you've been at 10 and, and, and it's time for you to go to 20 or 10.006 or something like that. I mean, this is life of repentance. This is why I love the idea of a tithe. Not just because I work at a church. I love the idea of a tithe because of this constant life of repentance. Every time I give 10% to this church, what I'm doing is I'm smacking myself right in the selfishness, right in the greed. I'm basically saying, greed, you are not in charge. It's such a healthy practice for us. Um, we want to satisfy our sexual cravings, heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, whatever sexual but instead we resist that urge, we turn from those desires, and we submit to God's order of things. Trusting our sacrifice will result in life and fruitfulness, not just for ourselves, but for our communities and families and the next generation. And we do it because Jesus sacrificed everything. Jesus resisted temptation in every single way, the Bible says. Tempted in every way, yet never gave in. There was, a, there was a girl in our church who's a high schooler, and uh, she talked to her parents one time, and, and they were part of the church, and she said that she's, she feels like she's a bisexual, and she was wanting them to know, and, and uh, she could feel that. You know, she was wrestling with it all, and she said, I, I definitely think this is what I am, and I just wanted you guys to know, and she said, but... I've been listening to the teachings at Living Streams and I'm listening to you guys and, and I do think that Jesus has a different way than that. And so I want you to know that though I feel this is true of me, I'm going to resist those desires because I want to follow Jesus. <laughs> which, is, which is amazing. It's a high schooler. When I was in high school, I didn't even have a brain. Um, <laughs> let alone a spirit, and I walk with the Lord. And, and I just was with, you know, the dad, and he wanted to update me because she's now in college, and she said to him, Dad, I was never bisexual. That was just something I was wrestling with. I didn't know anything about it, but I'm so glad that I didn't partake in there because that is not me at all. And I was just like, thank you, Lord, for saving this girl from all of that. Yeah. Yeah, well done, you guys, well done, everyone who's been praying, well done. I mean, that is just a beautiful story, and we're praying for more and more of those stories. And again, not just, I mean, if she would have participated and wakes up in college and then discovers this, the, Lord, the Lord's got a plan for that, and he can restore all of that, but it's so beautiful to see um, that taking place. And the way you guys are living and the way that you guys are speaking and raising your kids, it's going to make a difference. It's going to have impact, not just for you, but for generations to come. So that's what it, th those are some of the ways it could look like practice, practically. Another way to look at it is it's turning away from sin and turning towards righteousness. Um, the word shuv in the book of Hosea really does have to do with, um, like, it's basically like the picture is you walk across the bridge away from sin and then you blow up the bridge. That's like what shuv is. It's like you're, you're, you're serious. You're deadly serious about this. It's basically you, you used to have a house over in the land of sin and you just lit it on fire and walked away, kind of slow motion like in the movies as it just blew up and burst into flames. I don't know if it's that part, but I hope so. But it's, it's basically, it's, and what the New Testament says, it's you're dying to your old ways. You're mortifying the deeds of the flesh, crucifying the flesh. There's an intensity to it. And what Alex Seekins was describing is it's, it's almost like someone who takes their drugs and they flush them down the toilet and they delete the number of their dealer. And there is that aspect of turning 
of, of seriousness. But then, but then it also has an aspect of turning towards something. It's not enough to just pause sin or turn from sin. We're supposed to now live towards the way of God, live towards righteousness. And uh, John the Baptist, when he came um, on the scene and Jesus called him the greatest prophet of all, guess what his message was to the people? Repent, <laughs> for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, 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 turn. And he said, I can baptize you with water, which is kind of this awakening where you're realizing this is the wrong way to go, and I want to go this way. He's waking them up. He's kind of splashing cold water on their face so they can see they need to turn. But he said, there's one coming after me, and he's not going to baptize you in the same way as me. He's not just going to baptize you with water. He's going to baptize with you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. It was this promise of something to come. Something powerful. And when the Pharisees actually came to Jesus, the, the religious people, to count, or to John the Baptist, to figure out what he was all about, he said, hey, you guys are awake to God. You, you actually know about God, but you're not doing um, works of repentance. You're not bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. Your lifestyle doesn't show any repentance. And then the people said to John the Baptist, well, what do we do? And John the Baptist he responded in Luke chapter 3. He said, if you have two coats, you give one to somebody who doesn't have one. If you have food, cut it in half and give half to somebody. If you're a tax collector, how many tax collectors in the house? Just kidding. If you're a tax collector, you don't take any more than you're supposed to. Even though you could, you could get away with it. You don't, you don't take anything extra. In fact, you make sure you take the L in every situation. If there's any kind of gray area or blind spot, you just go ahead and you take the L. In your business dealings, when you're working with people, you don't strong arm and try and come out ahead. You, you pursue exquisite mutuality in all of those deals. That's rubber boots hitting the ground. That's the rubber meeting the road. That's his response in all of these things. If you really want to return to the Lord, come to him, turn from where you are, and then walk in these ways because that's at the heart of our Father. So now we're going to kind of end our service a little strange again because um, I just feel like we're doing a message on returning and, re and repenting. We might as well give space for that. Um, yes, I want to see it show up outside these walls, but sometimes it does start right here. And so we got a, we got a, we got a, a buffet of options for you today. <laughs> um, one, you have communion in your hand. And this is just going to be you and the Lord. We're not going to lead you in it. This is just you taking the body of uh, this bread, which represents the body of Jesus, that was broken for you. If you need one, you can raise your hand up. They'll hand one. Um, and you're going to take and you eat that in remembering what Jesus did for you. And then, and then the blood, the, the juice represents the blood that you'd be cleansed. His body was broken so we could be made whole. And his blood was shed so we could be cleansed. So we're going to do that. But I also am really wanting to challenge our church to go to your knees right now. I just feel like there's no better place for the church to be than on our knees. And I'm going to be up here, and if, it, if you're comfortable, come on up to the front. Just kind of get out of the space you're in right now. Come seek the Lord. Meet the Lord. If you need to just get in the aisles, whatever it is, but, but kind of press in. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. And so press into that space. And what I want you to do is I just want you to ask the Lord to come with his water, to wake you up, to come with his fire, to clarify and cleanse and consecrate you or to come with his spirit to guide and empower you to walk in this way. Maybe you need all three. Maybe you just need one. But this is what we're going to do. We're going to come. We're going to seek his face and say, Jesus, will you baptize us with your water, with your fire, with your spirit so that we can actually walk in these ways, in your ways. So this is it. It's now between you and the Lord. Enjoy.